How can we help people learn in ways so they can apply what they've learned in new situations? So that, that's the classic issue of transfer that's been uh, around in education and in psychology for over 100 years. It was really one of the in initial questions in the science of learning and also in, in education. Um, and so um, in kind of looking at ways to try to improve transfer, uh, especially of, of kind of mathematical and scientific concepts, it kind of drew me to looking at the role of graphics because we know a lot about verbal learning, but we don't know quite as much about uh, visual learning and how, how you can use visualizations to help people understand. So for example, I've done a lot of research on multimedia learning and I've developed um, oh, about a dozen principles of multimedia design based on um, experimental comparisons between one group that um, gets a pres one lesson and another group that gets the same lesson but with some feature added to it. So I kind of have an idea of which features promote learning and which ones don't. And for example, some of the main principles are the coherence principle, which is the idea of you know, keeping the presentation simple and focused. If there's too much extraneous um, material, uh, so in the case of video, if there's just too much detail that can distract people from the main focus of what you want them to pay attention to. Because we are limited in our uh, processing capability, we humans have a very limited working memory, we can only a focus on a few things at one time, it's important that we not overload people with too much going on on the screen. Um, another principle is um, contiguity principle, that um, if we're going to have text and graphics, it's good to incorporate um, the text next to the part of the graphic that is relevant. So if we're going to have on-screen text that's superimposed on the video, it should not be placed as a caption. It should be placed next to the part of the of the image that it's talking about so that people don't have to look back and forth. They can, the text is right next to where you should be looking. Just making technology available to people doesn't work very well. We know that from the whole history of educational technology, of all, all the failed technologies that have been out there. Making it available is not enough. It has to be integrated into the instructional program in a way that makes sense to, to teachers. So. Um, and that really gets back to the issue of good instructional design. And, you know, in the field of instructional design, you start with clear objectives, you know, and you're really asking yourself, what do we want students to learn? What, what is the change in knowledge we're trying to promote here? And then we have to use video in service of those objectives. I think just saying, you know, here's some cool videos to watch, see, see, you know, see what you think, that's not going to be very effective if, if they're not directed towards the learn learning objectives. It's not really the media that causes learning, it's the instructional method that causes learning. This is a point that um, Dick Clark has made over and over again in the research literature that um, there, there's no research showing that one medium is better than another. We can't say video is better than textbooks or computers are better than face-to-face -face or something. Um, it's the instructional method we use. So I think we, we need to look at um, what are effective instructional methods for video that we can incorporate in video? And, and are there affordances um, in video that are particularly uh, important? Th does it allow us to have certain instructional methods that are more difficult otherwise? And, and I think the same basic instructional principles apply in video as would apply in you know, any kind of instructional situation. And I think it's also good to use video for, um, um, for what it's particularly good at, which is, I would say, personalization. So if we, we want to understand okay, um, Piaget's theory, it might be good to get a short clip of him actually describing it himself, um, because you could see he's a real person. <laughs> and it doesn't have to be long, but it just kind of gets you to know, maybe. And, and also, I think video is good for concretizing things. So you can explain forever you know, what something how something works, like how a pulley system works, but actually seeing it in, a, in a, just a short video or even an animation is, is really useful also. So I think there are particularly good ways to use video. You could have really great production quality and, and a completely ineffective lesson if it isn't designed you know, based on pedagogical principles. So to me, the number one issue is that it's pedagogically sound adding lots of glitz and color and sound and motion and interactivity, those things 
don't necessarily promote learning. I would focus on, you know, making sure that the, the material is understandable and presented in a way where students are going to be able to feel like, hey, I get it. Video has a very important place, um, and what we need to understand is, you know, how to <laughs> how to use it in in the most effective way. So I, I, my my approach is to try to take an evidence-based approach. Look at what we know about how the human mind works. Look at what the research has to say about how people process information and use that to design you know effective learning experiences including video. Educational video is a really multidisciplinary activity and it requires you know, people who are good on the production side and, uh, and understand how to um, how to make a professional video but it also requires subject matter experts and experts in educational um, design or instructional design and experts in um, um, even uh, cognitive, the cognitive science of learning. So I think it's we need all we need all of those fields represented in in the development of high quality you know educational video.